Uh, my name's Lee Faust. I work at GitHub. Uh, I am a senior solutions architect. I work with all of our channel partners. I go around and give these types of presentations to them all of the time, um, explaining best practices for how to use Git and GitHub uh, with their customers. So you're kind of getting a, a, a sneak peek at why we actually encourage companies to use public repositories. So we get a lot of questions at GitHub. We've actually had a few people even this morning as they came by our booth, is our competitors will offer free private repos. And when they offer free private repos, they think that it's important to keep their code close to their vest. And one of the biggest things that we see in the community is there's a lot of additional tooling that you can actually use if you just chose to make your code freely available. And when I say free, I mean you're going to want to put a license in there. You're going to want to put in a license file. You're going to want to put in a contributing file um, to let people understand that, hey, I'm actually doing some very interesting things. Uh, one of the projects we'll actually look at today is a group that I'm mentoring out of Brazil that has an open source uh, chat application that looks and feels a lot like Slack but it's completely open sourced, it's written completely in Meteor. Um, so we'll take a look at that as one of the different plugins that we have. So for me, I am actually based in Charlotte, North Carolina, actually Mooresville, just north of there, uh, home of NASCAR. So uh, I never realized um, I, when I moved there, I'm driving around and I'm expecting to see like Jeff Gordon driving down Main Street in his car. Um, but that's not the way it is. All of the actual teams are hidden back in this little uh, business park. And then all of a sudden you go through and it's just one after another. Um, I've actually been a software developer for, um, I have stopped, I don't know about you guys, I stopped counting at 20. So I'm not actually going to say how many years of experience I actually have. Um, but I've done a little bit of everything. I started off as a high school teacher teaching math and computer science. I then became a professional trainer. I helped write the very first Java curriculum. I was a Sun Java instructor. Um, I've been an architect. I've been a mentor. I've been an evangelist. Been around the block a few times. So a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today come from experiences that I've had both running projects as well as um, being a part of a project. So. One of the first things I want to talk about is something that is near and dear to everybody's heart, which is process, because we all love it so much. And when we talk about process, I remember back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I worked for a small uh, startup called TogetherSoft. And it was the time that UML was all the rage, and we had a great product that allowed you to be able to keep your UML class models and your source code, and you, it would keep the two of them in sync. And everybody that used the product loved it. And nowadays, we don't see people following those types of very formal architectural uh, type processes. And I think that part of the change that we saw is we moved the emphasis in the late 90s to early 2000s away from the developer and moved it to the project manager. And when we moved it to the project manager, we started creating all these really cool buzzwords, scrums, extreme programming, pair programming, test-first development. And the people who did the process found this really neat way to feel like they were part of the development process and they had control of their developers. Now, those of us that are developers in the room, how many developers do we have? Okay, got a few developers in the room. So we realized that nobody will ever control us. So. What we ended up doing is we ended up creating this really bad process around how we deliver applications. So the process people would sit there and say, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by creating issues, having bugs, features, having all of these things available to us, and we're going to create this backlog of all this work that needs to be done. Anybody here who has ever been a part of a large rollout your backlog looks like you've got work to do for 20 years, and you never feel like you're ever getting anywhere. The next thing that you have is you then get every two weeks or every three weeks, you get a Monday morning and you dread driving to work because you're like, 
today is sprint planning day. And you get in that meeting and you're sitting down and the developers are sitting in this meeting talking to somebody who has no idea what it, do, what it takes to actually build software. And even worse, there's nobody in the room from operations, there's nobody in the room from QA, and you're sitting there and you're having this conversation about what you're about to build. And once we go ahead and say, yeah, you know what, I think these are the four or five things I think we can complete during this next sprint. You go off and you send your developers away. And they all sort of go off on their own little islands. And they take their task and they start building. Now, unfortunately, one of the things that I go around and I talk to our customers about is we've lost the science in computer science. And what I mean by that is it's more about the deliverable than about the hypothesis and the testing of possible scenarios to create repeatable patterns for the overall delivery of your application. So I can tell you that I laugh and I joke, but truly I believe that we have gotten to the point, especially with GitHub, I don't know if I've actually written a ton of code lately. I do a lot of copy and paste. So I go around, I find a method, yeah, that's exactly how I want to do this. Oh, there's a gem that already does that for me. Oh, there's a jar that does this. And basically all I'm doing is I'm just stitching a little bit of connectivity to be able to give me an application on the back end. Now, unfortunately, there's repercussions to that as well. Because we're not giving people an opportunity to be able to test, well, there's eight different gems that give me authentication. Which one of them's right? So with GitHub, one of the things we'll look at after this particular slide is there's never any collaboration. There's one developer who makes the choice for an entire organization that creates technical debt because they chose one gem, and they chose that gem because it was good enough, and they don't rely on anybody else from any other teams that say, hey, have you checked out this one? This one's a lot better for our organization because it also does another feature that we need for this other part of the application. And we all know that once it's gone into production, it is really hard to remove it. So we go through this process and the developer goes ahead and completes it. And luckily, if you're in a lucky environment, you've got some type of continuous integration on the back end. You're doing builds and those builds are coming back and hopefully they're, they start off and this is one of the other things that's a pet peeve of mine. The first time you do your first commit, I really hope your build fails. In all honesty, it's actually a good thing to have a build fail. If your builds are always green, something is wrong. It means that you're not doing the right type of testing. It means that the developers that you have are um, not including performance metrics and they're not deploying and using things like Selenium to be able to test the UI. They're, we're not perfect. And as a developer, I can tell you, I am far from perfect. But one of the things that I love to see is an application that gets better and better and better over time. And as I'm adding some code, there's always more code that's being reduced. And that's really critical when we talk about CI and CD pipelines. The biggest thing for us is the reason why we want to deploy, deploy more often into a dev environment or into a staging environment is we want to know what breaks when we deploy. We don't know that, oh, we have a limited set of, we only have um, uh, five one terabyte drives. Nobody ever told us that we were collecting 100 terabytes worth of data. So there was never any planning for it. So as we go through and we're doing these deployments, we can start to see what those cycles actually look like. And we can start preparing and start being proactive in those cycles. Now, at the end of a, a sprint cycle, we wait, so a developer who has a task for only two days, after two days they pick up their next task, and they start building the next two-day task, and then they build the next two-day task, and then they build a one-day task. And then the next thing you know, at the end of two or three weeks, that one developer has maybe built four or five different things in that one sprint. Now we do a code review. This is the best time to do a code review. I have no idea what I built those first two days. And now you're sitting down and you pull a room, you get a nice little uh, projection screen and you say, okay, the project manager goes ahead and collects and says, we're now gonna talk about everything that's been changed. And you have a number of people on a Friday afternoon, ACC tournaments on, you wanna get home, you wanna watch the big Georgia Tech game that night, and 
Are you really going to speak up and say, you know what, I really think that those four things need to be redone? You're just trying to get through that meeting and you're trying to get done with it. So what happens is, is at the end of that first code review, the project manager sits there and says, hey, I need everybody to vote. I need a go, no go decision. I don't ever think I've ever been in a meeting like that where the developers have said, yeah, it's a no go. We're going to have to push. We're going to have to wait. Operations team will tell you it's a no-go, but the developers will never say it's a no-go. So the project manager thinks everything's good. So then they push it into QA. QA goes through their cycle. They go ahead and they do all of these tests. And the tests come back and almost 80% of it's failing. And all of a sudden the project manager goes, I don't know how this can be. The developers all said it's working perfectly. And QA says, yeah, we were all the functional tests, 80% of them are failing. I think it's wrong. So then a, a negotiation takes place between the project manager and the QA manager saying, how many of these things are, are they really going to hit? Really? I mean, if they go ahead and they type their password in correctly three times and we just log them in anyway, is that really a big deal? I mean, come on. So we go through another set of subjective go, no go. And now all of a sudden you've got a project manager and a QA manager who unfortunately are given a bonus based on if they make their schedule. Not on what the quality of the software that's being released, but it's based on are they actually delivering frequently? And are they making their dates? So now the QA manager and the project manager have this little conversation, do, do we go, no go? L let's go, we'll go ahead, we'll go forward. If we hit some issues in production, we'll just, We'll play it off and we'll just issue those items back onto the backlog for the next set of, for the next sprint. So now all of a sudden it goes into operations and this is the worst part. Because now all of a sudden we're trying to deploy it and none of the scripts work. We're using an application that's running Java and the container, the JVM needs 16 gig of memory and we're trying to run it on machines that only have eight. Um, our infrastructure team is trying to move containers, and we have not built an architecture at all that's microservices enabled, and we're trying to do this huge, massive database migration. So what ends up happening is we go through another set of go, no go decisions, and it's very subjective. And what happens is, is the operations team gets it on Thursday, and you've got a scheduled delivery for Saturday. The last thing they want to do is be the people at the very end of a four week or three month cycle of all of these changes and sit there and be the person to say, I can't do it. They're expected just to fix it, just make it work. So they end up going ahead and agreeing, I'll push it one last time. So as we go through this process and we ship, we are not shipping quality code. It has nothing to do with a developer not knowing what the requirements was. It has nothing to do with the QA team not doing their job. It has nothing to do with the operations people not providing the infrastructure to be able to run the application. It's about transparency. It's about collaboration. Nobody's talking to anybody else through that entire cycle. So at GitHub, one of the things that we talk about is what is the status? We never get continuous feedback on what is the current status. Is it broken? Is it deployed? Did we meet our customers' needs? We wait until the end of that entire process to then gather feedback. So at GitHub, one of the things that we talk about in a modern CI CD DevOps workflow, and DevOps to us is not a technology. It has nothing to do if, if you're using Puppet or if you're using Chef. It has nothing to do if you're using containers or if you're deploying to VMs or if you're deploying to the mainframe. DevOps is a culture, and that culture is transformative inside of an organization. So I talk to a lot of our partners, and it's really interesting. I've now sort of figured out that they all fit into one of two categories. They either want to do application automation which takes them to the point that they're building application and they build a package, and that package could be a Docker image, it could be a VM image, it could be a jar, it could be a gem, it could be a war, it could be an ear, it could be a DMG, it could be a lot of different things, but they're creating a package, but that's where they stop. Then I have other folks that are doing infrastructure automation. 
That infrastructure automation team are the ones who are writing the puppet scripts, the chef scripts. They're determining how do we automatically provision the disk? How do we put monitoring in place at the hypervisor level to know what's deployed where? They're doing inventory management to know which database is tied to which application, which is tied to uh, which CDN on the front end. They're keeping track of all of that infrastructure and they're all trying to automate it because just like everybody else, their budgets are shrinking. So the business wants it delivered quicker and everybody else in the team, their roles are increasing, but the number of people is decreasing. And I don't think it's decreasing because we just don't have budget. It's because we don't have people to know how to ask for budget. And we also don't have people qualified enough to be able to fit into the roles that exist. So people just get frustrated. And they sit there and say, we've had this opening in operations for a, a puppet administrator for six months. We can't find anybody. So they just go ahead and just close the wreck and just say, we'll send somebody to puppet training. And now that person has one more task on their things to do. So from a GitHub perspective, we have something inside of GitHub called a pull request. How many people here know what a pull request is? Wow, this is, I have been at GitHub for 18 months. I have been a GitHub user for eight years. This is the first time that I would say 80% of the room actually knows what a pull request is. So we're obviously getting out there and we're talking about it in the right way. So now when we talk about what this workflow looks like, it's no longer agile, lean, DevOps. It's not anything else. It's just collaboration. It's about getting people together and actually talking about things together and actually making sure that everybody is making an informed decision. So now we still have the same way. We're still collecting our issues. We're creating our bugs. We're creating our features. We're putting them into a backlog. But we're collaborating on that backlog with QA, with operations, with the developers, with the project managers, with the business analysts. It's all together. Everybody is working together. Then what we do is in, we take a developer. They're no longer out on an island. The first goal of a pull request is the first thing that they do is they create a commit. And that commit could just be a unit test. It could be um, a design document. It could just be a markdown file with what they are planning on building and what steps they need to do. One of my favorite things that I saw at a customer is they use Gherkin and Cucumber, and the pull request is actually opened by the business analyst. The business analyst writes the Cucumber test and actually puts that into a branch, and then that's where the developer actually comes in and builds the implementation. So, that's a, a much higher level. They're, they're setting the bar really high for their organization, but they are also releasing almost four times a day into production. And it's because that they've, they're collaborating. The business analyst has seen, again, it's copy and paste. Well, I know when I see a Gherkin formatted cucumber test, and I want to go ahead and I want one that sort of looks like that. They go out to a little regex explorer and they put in the regex of what uh, certain things should look like and they go ahead and they just copy and paste and put it in as a new commit. So the tooling is becoming a lot better around that as well. Now, as soon as that initial commit is done and the push happens into GitHub, whether that be github.com or GitHub Enterprise, um, the pull request is open and collaboration starts to take place the things that we see from that pull request. Hey, did you know that this other team did this exact same thing six months ago? You might want to go look at what they built. There might be a way to reuse it. The, another conversation that takes place is operations comes in and says, if you want to use that particular jar, we know there's a security hole in it, and we're going to have to push this. We know that a fix isn't coming from our vendor for three months. So let's go ahead and just pause right here. Imagine that developer who's building these two-day, one-day tasks being able to get that feedback on day one. They can immediately move and go on to the next task. I don't, I don't go ahead and close that pull request. I don't delete it. I've got a conversation. That person can come back and pick it up at a later point in time. That collaboration as it's taking place, the other thing inside of GitHub is that pull request, the conversation that takes place, lives for eternity. As long as you are using that particular repository, even if you rename that repository, the pull request will still be there. So on the back end, the branch with all of the commits will still be listed in between there. And you can still go back and revert and bring that branch back from a point in time. I worked for a very large insurance company. And one of the things that I had never seen in my entire history of building applications is 
they need a way from a security, regulatory, and auditing process to be able to go back in time up to seven years. Imagine being able to go back and say, oh, I need to know what the application looked like six years ago and hit the revert branch button and just go ahead and push off of that branch into production. Let me go ahead and see what the application looked like. Put it out into a staging environment. The other thing that's really important is pull requests don't always have to be merged. You may go down a rabbit hole and you may decide that what you've, the changes you just made aren't right. So you may actually choose to just close that pull request, keep all of the conversation that took place, and then go ahead and start a new branch and a new pull request for the new changes. And that's where I talk to people about bringing the science back into computer science. Allow me to create a hypothesis, allow me to go make some changes, and let me go ahead and bring it back. Once we go ahead and merge into master is when we start doing our deploys. This is where it gets interesting, the tooling around open source, the reason why we build our projects and we use public repositories. So one of the things that we have are 12-factor uh, applications. This is a pattern um, for actually delivering applications where really common sense things, make sure you're using version control, making sure that you're abstracting out all of your properties for your database connectivity strings, making sure that they are parameterized so you can actually pull those in at any particular point in time from some sort of metadata management on the back end. The other thing is, is building out microservices. So when we build things in smaller chunks, we can update them much faster than we can a big monolithic application. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to exit out of here. So this is my alter ego. Let me go ahead and uh, maximize this. So actually, not yet. So um, one of the things inside of GitHub is you've got your repositories. So this user continuously knows that there's this other really cool person at GitHub. And I'm going to go look at his repositories. There he is. So this Lee Faust character has this really cool application that I've been looking at. And it's this notifications, this repository. And this looks like it's a Rails app. So I want to go ahead and I want to go ahead and see how this looks. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to fork this. And I'm going to fork this to my other user. So now you can see that continuously now has a copy of this repository. Now, one of the things that's really cool, those of you that might be concerned that we made a copy, the way that Git works, this is actually some, a technology that GitHub has built that we actually call net sharding. So what we've done is we're actually using Git to track the changes across this new repository. This repository, if we actually looked at it on the back end inside of GitHub's infrastructure, the size of this repository right now would be zero. So it's not until I start making changes in this fork that the repository starts to grow. This repository is only going to be storing the changes off of the baseline forked repository. So when I am inside of here, I have the settings tab. And the settings tab has a place for webhooks and services. Now, as long as this repository is public, there is a lot of tools that I can actually use for free. So one of my favorite ones that I like to use is something called Travis CI. How many people here have heard of Travis CI? Awesome. How many of you know that Travis CI has an on-premise solution? Ah. So um, Travis CI can, uh, they're just like GitHub Enterprise. You actually have to contact them, but they do have a version of Travis CI. It all runs in Docker containers locally. Um, but you can actually run it inside your own infrastructure if you're concerned about somebody do, having to do a Git clone and move that data into their um, cloud solution. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to sync accounts. And what we're going to see right now is there's this notifications. So all I have to do is just click on this notifications and right now, underneath Travis CI, let me refresh. 
And let's see here. Why is that not showing up? The issue with demoing things that are live. Oh, there it is. It is there. Sorry. OK, so right now, there's no builds for this repository. So you actually have two different ways to build. Now, as you're learning about how to do CI, from GitHub, we actually have a number of different ways that you can actually get data. How many people here use Jenkins? OK, so if you're using Jenkins, how many of you are just using the Git plugin? OK, how many of you are using the GitHub plugin? Yes, thank you, guys. One of the reasons why we like people to use the GitHub plugin is because it will actually use a webhook, and it will actually go ahead and look at the changes that have happened when a push occurs. When you're using just the Git plugin, it pulls. So you basically specify in a regular expression the branches that you're watching, and then every five minutes, every 10 minutes, whatever it is, it's going to go ahead and poll to see if there are any changes inside of that repository. The bad thing about that is when you are doing polling, you are actually not doing CI. Because what happens is if I go ahead and I set my poll to happen every hour to look for changes, I may have had 28 changes occur in that hour. So I'm only going to get the status of the last bill of the last push that happened just before the hour that you decided to trigger your build off of. So there may have been 27 good builds in between there, and the 28th one is the one that failed. So you're not seeing all of the good stuff that's happened. You're only seeing the last bad one. So when we actually use um, pull requests and we use something called webhooks, webhooks inside of GitHub allow us to be able to um, watch whenever a change occurs inside of a repository and automatically go ahead and do a build. So here what we can see is um, here are our pull requests. So what we could do is we can look at our settings. And when we look at the settings, we can say build only if there is a Travis YAML file. This YAML file, there are a lot of different configurations that you can do. So here's some of the docs that you have for Travis CI. So you can do things like automatically deploying to Heroku. You could automatically deploy to IBM Bluemix. Um, you could deploy to your local internal infrastructure. You could create a Docker image and publish it to um, a Docker Hub. There's all kinds of things you can do on the back end uh, through Travis. Now, when we go ahead and let me see here. So here I'm saying I want to build on pushes and I want to build on pull requests. So now again, doing this live. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my repository, and I'm going to go here, and let me go into my welcome controller, and I'm just going to go ahead. Now, this is something that was new probably halfway through last year. Um, one of the things a lot of people don't realize is from inside of GitHub, we have a full-fledged web editor. So as you can see, I just made changes directly to the code directly from inside of GitHub. Um, when we're in here, right now, we know that one of the best practices is right now it's asking me if I want to commit directly to master. Probably don't want to commit directly to master. What I can do is I can create a new branch Here, what it's going to do is I just started typing, and it's automatically going ahead and creating a new branch, telling me what it's going to be. And it's also going to start a pull request automatically for me. So I'm going to say, added something cool. The other thing when you're in here is we have a lot of people that like to have fun with their pull requests. So I'm going to say, Use some emojis, all of those things. That's the developer side. Of, that's the operations side 
of a lot of this. What I hope that you saw today is how you can bring operations folks into the conversation so they can actually see the changes that are actually coming forward. Thank you very much. I know that I'm out of time, probably a little over time. Uh, I'm more than willing to take any questions afterwards. Uh, so come on up and ask any questions. Thank you.